that it made your nose hairs just, just turn, just turn. Like you went, you're like, oh my, oh, oh. <laughs> Terrible, right? I got, I had a situation happen one time to me when I was probably like 11 or 12. So my grandparents have a farm, right? So they've got chickens on their farm. The neighbor has cows. So like, I spent a month at a time every summer there. So I was used to smells, right? Used to farm smells. Well, one day, my little brother and my grandfather's farmhand and myself are exploring and digging stuff up. Because, I mean, you know, that's what guys do. We just like to mess with stuff. And we're digging, and we see this bottle in the ground. Oh, okay, yeah, what is that? And I was like, oh, it's a Sunny D bottle. And so I dig it up. My brother picks it up, and we're looking at it. This thing is neon blue. Like, the, the stuff inside of it is neon blue. And it's got this white, chunky stuff inside of it. And so, being guys... What did we do? We should, have probably, we should have probably put it down, right? Or like reburied it because it was probably buried for a reason. No, we didn't poke it with a stick. That was a good, ch- that was a good answer. No, my brother decides, let's see what it smells like. He's just literally throwing up all over the place. And of course, I'm like, dude, come on, man. You got a weak stomach. What is wrong with you? Because he used to get sick and all that. I was like, let me see that. So I smell it. And of course, he took like a little sniff of it. So I take a whip. Like I'm going to inhale deeply. I'm like... And I'm like just throwing up everywhere, all over the place. And you would think after two guys have just smelled something rancid, the third guy would say, no, man, I don't want to do that. But what did he do? Hell, he smelled it. And what did he do? And we're sitting there just like crying. We're like, oh, it's so terrible. We did it twice. (laughs) I don't know why. I was a very wise child. I don't know why I decided to smell this twice. And so... We decided, let's just bury it again because this is terrible and nobody should ever smell this. So we just, we covered it up. Now, I feel like we've all had that situation or moment where we walk into a room or to an area or into a bathroom. You walk in, you're just like, ooh, ooh. And you immediately have to turn the other cheek and walk out the door, right? We've all had that experience, right? Now, I'm sure you're curious. I'm sure you're wondering why we're talking about smells today. Why we played a game that involves smelling stuff. Why I shared a story about smelling stuff that smelled terrible. Well, it's going to tie in beautifully to our service. Hey, by the way, you guys see this pile right here of stuff that's kind of foaming and like kind of just like steaming right here? You wonder what that is? Manu- it's manure. Oh, oh, it's manure. Yeah. Now, I'll explain to you later why I have that. There's a knife in there, actually. I'm going to pull that out because that's gross. All right, so I'll explain to you later why we have that on the stage. But for now, just... Front row, just enjoy the smell of glory. Enjoy it. So now, we started this new series today. We started this new series today. It's called Law and Order. It's an Old Testament study. We're studying the book of Leviticus, right? Now, I don't know how many of you all have ever read through the Old Testament or looked through the Old Testament, but when I opened it to Leviticus, I said, oh, this is really weird. Two things stuck out to me, two major things. Leviticus 1 through 7. First thing that stuck out was there were a ton of sacrifices. Like they were killing animals left and right, just like slay in the name of Jesus, slay in the name of God. So that was the first thing. And the second was how many times, 11 times in seven chapters it says, and it was a pleasant aroma to God. Now I'm thinking to myself, I've been around where animals are slaughtered and like some kind of like, ever been around where an animal has died or something like that? Just like rotting. Let's imagine rotting food in your fridge. You open it, you're just like, mmm. Now imagine that smell times a thousand. That's going throughout all the camp, and, and it's saying it was a pleasant aroma to God. So that's what's in my mind. And I'm thinking, okay, how on earth could they say it's a pleasant smell? Now, reading through Leviticus, most people would say, okay, this makes no sense. It doesn't relate to me, right? Because it's really old. It's a book of laws. But every functioning society needs laws, right? Without laws, we'd probably be in a bad situation. Now there are some laws that are pretty weird and pretty, pretty dumb. Like the fact that you can't have an ice cream cone in your back pocket on a Sunday in Georgia, because if a horse follows you home on a Sunday, it's your horse. Well, yeah, it's a weird law, right? People used to put ice cream cones in their back pocket. That way a horse would follow them home and okay, they got a free horse. All it took was an ice cream cone. And then there's some more serious laws, like you're not supposed to murder people. It's pretty, pretty, pretty important, right? Like I feel like out of those two laws, I might be more likely to obey the, hey, don't murder people because that's serious, versus the don't have an ice cream cone in your back pocket. But laws are created for a reason. Laws are established for a reason. And see, this book right here, Leviticus, is God giving his law to his people. 
And if you look at Leviticus 1 through 7, it's actually just, it's talking about, okay, the different sacrifices that God had to give. So actually, I'm going to read really quick from Leviticus 1. I think it's verses 1 through 5. So bear with me for a second here as I read to you God's word. So hey, pay, pay attention. Don't be texting anybody or doing anything you shouldn't be doing. I'd ask you to stop chewing, but I can't hear you. So anyway, so Leviticus 1, it says, The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, as you're offering an animal from earth for the herd of the flock, if the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer the male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it may be acceptable to the Lord. You may lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on your behalf to make an atonement for you. So we're going to go through basically five. I don't know why I put four fingers up. Five different offerings that are, are basically painted out in Leviticus. Now, in the first chapter, it talks about, Leviticus 1, it talks about this idea of a burnt offering. So what they did with the burnt offering was they basically would say, okay, I have something going on in my life, and I need to basically sacrifice an animal. It's not like I go pray to God, go talk to Jesus, because you couldn't do that. Normal people couldn't talk to God. They weren't allowed to. There was a separation between us and God. So what they would say was, okay, say, okay I'm going to bring this animal before God, and I'm going to lay my hand on its head. Now, you might wonder, what's the significance of putting your hand? And when I say lay your head, I mean it's like you're leaning. You hear this table creaking? You're leaning your entire body weight on this animal. And it's basically you saying, I am understanding the gravity of my sin, the weight of my sin. So I'm pressing this sin onto this animal, and that's the transferal of our sin to this animal. So then what happens next? They tear their animal apart. I mean, they're cutting it up in pieces, splattering blood all over the altar, doing all this stuff. It's actually strange. You look at the birds, and it talks about, and your parents are going to hate this, but it talks about how you actually will rip the bird's head off. Yes, it says rent, like twist, twist it off, twist the bird's head off, and then you're draining the blood, and you got to make sure you actually sacrifice it the right way. Now, you all, all said, ugh, gross, right? Because it is gross. Now, wait, I got a question for you. And I just want to see a show of hands. How many of y'all love the show Duck Dynasty? Oh. Amen, because this is the South, right? Now, I don't know if you saw the first season, episode four, where Uncle Phil, or I'm sorry, where Phil and Uncle Cy went to the school and they went for career day. Now, <laughs> yes, you know where I'm going with this. So Phil decides it's a great idea. He's going to take a duck. He's going to teach these young kids how to de-feather a duck and then pull it apart. And he's in the process of pulling it apart. And then all of a sudden, you hear him go, you hear a, oh, there goes the head, and it's just a psh, of blood, and the kids are like, ew, gross. Nasty. It's nasty, right? I mean, it was great TV, but it was nasty, right? Now, think about this. Kids that were Israelite kids back in that day, like your age, would see that and be like, it's the price of my sin. It's nothing special. It's nothing new. But today, we look at that, and we say, oh, my goodness. Like PETA, if y'all know what PETA is, it's about animal rights. They would go crazy. They would cry. They would go ballistic, but this was just a normal thing. So that, that burnt offering, actually, you can put up the, the first one that talks about burnt offering if you want to. That first slide for me, please. All right, so a burnt offering was an expression of devotion. So that's the first offering we talk about. So basically, God starts this, this idea with Moses and says, okay, you know what? You need to understand that you need to be devoted to me. So you need to sacrifice this bull or this male goat or this sheep or this dove, this turtle dove, ripping its head off. And it's an, an act of saying, hey, God... I am devoted to who you are, right? So that's one of the sacrifices. Now we go to chapter 2, and we've got a different sacrifice. So you can go ahead and put that up as well if you want to. And that is a grain offering. It's not up there yet. It'll be up there in a second. You can see what it is. But grain offering. So grain offerings were offered. Basically, it's a, a tenth of your grain, and it's the finest flour that you have. It's just, it's well done. It's, but you couldn't put yeast in it or honey in it because they said that that would ruin it. But it had to have salt in it. It had to be well taken care of. So this, this salt offering or this grain offering they would take, they would give it to the priests, and it was basically them saying, you know what, God, we're thankful for what you've given us. We're thankful for what you've provided, the fact that you even give us food to eat. You've taken us out of captivity, because if you remember, they were just in Egypt. Now, they'd been probably at Mount Sinai for maybe a year or so, so this is kind of like a boot camp for them of what God's shown them, hey, this is what you need to do and what you don't need to do. So they're saying, God, you know what? Thanks for splitting the Red Sea. Just in case we didn't tell you last time, thank you. I appreciate that. I like living each day. 
I'm glad I don't have to serve Pharaoh anymore. So that was, that was the second offering, right? So that's chapter two. We're going to fly through this, by the way. But there's a reason why. The third offering, if we pull that up really quick, is actually a fellowship offering. Now, this is where things get a little bit different. Now, with that burnt offering, I didn't tell you this before, but when they offer that animal up, the priest would burn the animal, and he would burn it for days. Anybody ever had some smoked meat before? I'm talking like brisket or smoked pork or that kind of stuff. You know it takes hours to cook that, right? Like I've cooked meat before where it took 21 hours to actually smoke these briskets. So we would get up in shifts to cook it. That's what these priests were doing with the burnt offering. They had to burn it to the point where there was no meat left. It was just ashes. And it says in Scripture that you had to burn it and the fire could never go out. Can you imagine that? It's just three of you guys. You got to burn this entire, it's not just a little cow. It's like a big old bull, just mm, bull. And you have to burn the entire thing. And you're just like, okay, the fire can't go out. And they didn't have the matches we have right now. They didn't have lighter fluid. They didn't have the little gas you could turn on. It was, okay, keep the wood blowing. <sighs> Blow the fire. <sighs> Blow the fire. They had to do this for days. But it switched up with the fellowship offering because all of a sudden, that animal that they took, they threw it on the grill for a little while, but then they took it off. We call that a barbecue. I don't know about you, but in the South, we love barbecue and sweet tea. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So all of a sudden, the fellowship offering is them saying, hey, God, you know what? We're just grateful that we get to be in your presence. We're grateful that you call us your people. We're grateful that we're called out and said, you know what? We're select people. So they would, when something happens, they're like, you know what, God? We're just going to praise you today. We're just going to cook some meat up. And so the priest, the priest had to do all the cooking. So obviously, the men knew how to handle the grill. That's what's up. So the priest would be cooking the stuff, and everybody would just hang out, and they would eat. And once again, it's a voluntary act of worship saying, God, we appreciate you. We appreciate who you are. We're grateful for what you're doing in our lives. And we just want to thank you for the fact that we get to have fellowship with other believers. But it's the fourth offering that really starts to switch it up. All of a sudden, we see a very different turn when we get to the sin offering. And they're going to put that up, all there, up there also. So the sin offering, we talked about how you had to give a bull, right, for the first burnt offering and how you would leave it on the grill or on the, basically on the altar, which is a bunch of wood and pyres, until it burned, bless you, completely to the point where it was gone, right? Well, the sin offering is very different. With the sin offering, they would, just like everything else, take the blood, splatter it on the altar, on all the corners of the altar, the north, east, south, and west corners of the altar. But then, instead of burning the animal on the altar, they would take the animal, and they would remove it. They would take it out to the farthest part of the town, basically outside of the town, and then they would kill it there. I'm sorry, they wouldn't kill it there, but they would, they would burn it there. They would burn it to pieces, and they would say, okay, God, we've removed our sin from our people. We've taken our sin away. Now, the big difference with that is the fact that the people didn't get to enjoy the sin offering. The fellowship offering, everybody got to eat, right? It was like a barbecue. Everybody hung out. It was great. It was good. But the sin offering was all of a sudden something very different that said, you know what, God, we acknowledge the fact that we are sinners. We acknowledge the fact that we are doing things that completely go against your will, and we're your people. Can you imagine this? You have a child, and you've given this child everything. You've taken care of this child, provided all of their needs, and the child looks at you and says, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do my own thing. It's heartbreaking, right? And so they recognize in their hearts that, okay, God, we've sinned against you. We've gone astray. We've done things we shouldn't do. Many times in Scripture, God is equated or basically compared to a shepherd. Now, I don't know if you know a lot about shepherds, but shepherds would leave, would leave flocks of sheep or goats, and they would always lead from the front. Many times you see people, when they've got shepherds, there, the shepherd's off in the corner next to a tree, kind of hanging out, chilling, just got his eyes looking for everything. That's not what shepherds did. Shepherds would go in front of the flock, and they would basically be the vision for it. They would see, okay, what's going on, what's happening. If they saw a sheep that went astray, they would go and find that sheep, and then they would bring it back to their, to their flock. So being a shepherd was a very active and, pa- and very active and very passionate job that you had to do. And so with that sin offering, they said, okay, God, we realize that you were very active in our lives, that you were constantly doing things in our lives. We acknowledge the fact that we need you. We desire you. And so they would do all these things. They had three offerings that they would do. They would just say, okay, God, we've taken care of it. We've covered up our sins. We've done what you told us to do. But then the next offering gets more interesting, and that's the guilt offering. So the guilt offering, like the sin offering, you had to take the animal outside of the city. And once again, people couldn't eat it. 
You just you weren't allowed to. It was considered an abomination to eat it. But what's very curious is that with the sin offering and with the guilt offering, the priests could eat the meat. The priests were allowed to eat any of the meat that was done for, if they burned it themselves, for a sin offering and for a guilt offering. But first, it had to be, the animal had to be killed, had to be gutted, had to be burned, and then they could eat the meat. And so it's curious because it says in Scripture that if somebody who was a commoner touched the meat, even touched the meat, they'd be made unclean, and they'd have to be cast out of the people, which basically means they wouldn't be able to worship until they were made clean again. So I want you to think about that. Imagine you see these priests or basically pastors eating a meal, and then you go to eat some as well and realize, I can't have this. It's kind of unfair, right? Because it was your cow, or it was your bird, or it was your bull. But all of a sudden, they're switching things up. So now I'm going to explain the reasoning behind the idea of this removal of the, the bull, removal of the animals and taking outside of the city. You all know that God tells us that he's going to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west, right? He's going to remove them from us and take them from us. But oftentimes, we say, well, I can just kind of ignore my sin, you know, just kind of dress it up, kind of cover it up, and I can sacrifice a bull. And if I sacrifice a bull and follow your laws, God, then my sin is covered. Now, according to God's scripture, which is his word, which is true, it is covered, correct? Yes, right? It's, it's taken care of, but it's still there. See, God gave Moses this law. The first thing he says is, if my people want to worship me, if they want to honor me, then they should offer things in my honor. So they should offer things that take time. They should just basically say, okay, your livelihood is your animals. Okay, well, then offer some of your animals. Your livelihood is the grain, the corn that you create. Okay, offer some of that. Whatever you have, even the poorest of the poor who didn't have animals, didn't have farms, didn't have the, the grain to offer, they would offer a certain percentage of money because they had to offer something. Because without offering something, your sins were not forgiven. Your sins were not washed away. Now, I told you how every time an animal was sacrificed, right, the people had to lean on the animal, right? They had to lean on the animal. They had to put their entire sin, their entire weight on the animal. And then the animal was cast out. Well, there's another offering that's actually, it's not even in this passage, but it talks about the goats. And they would basically, once a year, the high priest would take the blood of a goat and he would basically put the blood on his right earlobe, on his right big thumb and on his right big toe. Then he would put the, the blood on the head of the goat. And now this would take a long time. Then he would take the goat by its head, by its face, and he would speak the sins of the people. Every single sin. Can you imagine somebody speaking your sins in front of the entire congregation over an animal? That would look kind of weird, right? Be a little awkward. You'd be like, yeah, we just want to pray for Billy. And then one time he was out there and he looked at that girl and said, man, she's really attractive. I'd love to get to know her. God, we know that that was just not in your will. We know that was terrible. It's embarrassing, right? But this is what happened. This is what happened. They took all the sins and they put it on this goat. And so after this time was spent, the next thing that happens is they take the goat and the priest would send the goat out into the wilderness. Now, the symbolism behind that is just like how we talked about the, the bull that was taken outside of the city, taken outside of the presence of God's holy people. That goat was sent far away, and they prayed it never returned. But the goat was sent far away, and it was basically symbolism saying, this is what God does with our sins. When we acknowledge our sins, when we acknowledge him, when we give him thanks for acknowledging the fact that, hey, he's made us and given us redemption from those sins, he takes those sins and casts them away, and we never see them again. It was actually considered a curse if the goat ever came back. But isn't it cool that never once in recorded history did a goat come back? Never once did it come back to its home? Now, you know, we've, how many of y'all have dogs? Let me see your hands. How many of y'all have dogs? How many people have a dog that's ever run away? Yes. Okay. Now, my neighbor has a dog. My neighbor has two dogs, actually. There's times where they get out. They go explore, go do their own thing. But then what do they do? They come back because they know their way home, right? Do you know where you're being fed, where it's warm and where it's safe? And so imagine this goat knows where it's supposed to be, right? But what happens? The goat is sent away and it never returns. Now, how cool is that? Something that God does, he intervenes and says, you know what, I'm gonna send this, I'm gonna send your sin away. Imagine how terrifying it would be if God on the day of judgment came to you and said, hey, by the way, I know you prayed for forgiveness about this, you followed what I told you to do, but that sin was just so serious. You cheated on that test. You looked at that girl's answers. I saw you look. Don't act like it didn't happen. I saw you look. 
Now, some of y'all might feel a little guilty about that. That's okay. That's okay. I'm not saying it's okay to cheat, but I'm saying it's okay to feel guilty about your sin every now and then because it reminds you, okay, God, I am sinning. Now, what's really curious is there's actually, in that grain offering, there's a part that talks about our intentional sins and our unintentional sins. See, intentional sins is where you say, yeah, I know it's right. I know what I should do, but it's cool. I'm going to do what I want. And then there are those unintentional sins where you don't realize you're breaking God's, God's law. See, earlier today, not even 15 minutes ago, actually, we were talking about lawsuits and suing people. And I made a statement, and I was like, yeah, I totally sue somebody. Whatever. I don't know why it's such a big deal. And Chip said, it's in 1 Corinthians, or it's in Corinthians 7. It says you can't sue a believer. I was like, well, I did not know that. See, there are rules. Yes, I know, right? I, I'm studying the Bible. I didn't even notice that. It's terrible. There are rules and there are laws that are established by God that we don't always know about because it's impossible for us to know every single rule and every single law. But the reason behind that is they say, okay, you know what? There are sins that you're going to do, that you're going to commit, that you're not going to know about. So we're going to sacrifice these animals for that. And then that grain offering and the guilt offering also, they say, God, thank you for the fact that you don't call me out on the sins that I don't even know I'm doing. Now, I don't know many, how many of you all might struggle with this, but when I was probably 11 to 13 or so, I started watching porn. I'm going to be honest with you. My thought was, my parents had this talk with me when I was really young, the whole sex talk, and I was like, eh, I don't care. I'm good because I wanted to be a father. So I said, I'm not going to do anything that would jeopardize that. So in my mind, I said, well, I'm not having sex with a girl, so I guess I'm good. And that makes sense, right? Because I wasn't doing that sin. But what was I doing? I was sinning in a whole nother way. And now any of you who have struggled with a sin or are struggling with sin right now, which we all are, if we're going to be honest, know that there are times when we sin and we know we're sinning and we continue to sin. And then all of a sudden it just gets easier and easier and easier to sin. And then you realize, I didn't even realize I was still sinning. All of a sudden it's just something that just happens every day and you don't think about it. And see, it's not just that the sin is something that is intentional or unintentional. The sin changes who you are. We all know the story in Genesis about how God created us to be in perfect unity with him and how sin devastated all of creation. Not just us having fellowship with God, but it brought about natural disasters, brought about death, it brought about the fact that we can't talk to animals anymore. Little things like that, which blows my mind. Sin has devastated so much stuff, and it continues to change us completely. Now, what God says to his people, because there were other, other people groups who were sacrificing animals, but they weren't sacrificing them in the way we were. We were told to sacrifice our animals because we know that, okay, God, we accept that our, our sins go against you. Now, I didn't say this at first because I wanted to wait for it because I figured you probably already knew. There was a lot of bloodshed that went on when they were, they were killing these animals, a ton of it. And so much blood that they actually at times say the altar, the sand below the altar was actually red and was solidified with, with sand. It's kind of gross, right? Can you imagine that nasty smell? Imagine being a priest covered in that blood. But knowing that that blood that's covering you represents the life of these animals. And that life had to be taken away because sin came into our lives. Like God tells us that the penalty of sin is death, which is the opposite of life, right? So life was pulled from so many creatures on behalf of our sin. But what gets really interesting is when all of those sacrifices were done together. Because let's think about it. Sometimes you want to praise God because you're happy that you got an A in the test. Sometimes you're really upset with God. And you're just like, God, I don't know what's going on. There are times you say, God, I'm struggling so hard. And so there are different sacrifices. But when all the sacrifices are done on the same day is when it gets really curious. We're going to put that up here actually in a second as well. So it's multiple offerings. And basically I'll read it to you. Multiple offerings, sin and guilt, burnt offering, and then fellowship and grain. This is the order that the priest did the offerings when they had to present multiple offerings. Now, we talked about the idea that the, the sin and guilt offering, the sin offering is basically acknowledging the fact that we have sin in our lives. We do things intentionally on, on purpose that we shouldn't do. And then there are times when we just, we don't know. We would sue one of our Christian brothers because we didn't know that it says not to sue them. Whoops! And then the next one is the burnt offering. So the burnt offering 
basically symbolized the fact that, okay, God, we acknowledge the fact that we've got sin, we've got issues, and the burnt offering is basically us saying, God, we are going to devote ourselves to you. We are going to devote ourselves to understanding who you are, to following your law and your commandments. Because without that, we have no life. So the first thing they did was they acknowledged the fact that, hey, there are sins going on in their lives, that there's guilt in their lives. And the next thing they say is, okay, God, we want to devote ourselves to you. We want to pursue you. We want to follow you. Now, the, the next offering after that is the fellowship and grain offering. So it's actually five, your five offerings. The fellowship offering is them saying, okay, God, we are grateful for the fact that you've given us the opportunity to confess our sins. You've given us the opportunity to devote ourselves to you. You don't just say, you know what? You made a wrong decision. You stink. You smell terrible. You smell like decay and death. You say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept you. And so they rejoice in that, and they fellowship together. That's where they have that barbecue. They all hang out together. Is this starting to paint a picture for you guys? So the first thing they did, the sin offering, the sin offering was sending an animal outside of the city, saying, okay, hey, we can't eat this. We're going to burn it up. It's terrible. We have these serious problems. Next thing is saying, okay, we've got a burn offering. We've got to burn it to a crisp. We have to completely, completely devote ourselves to who Christ is. See, the idea of burning the animal to a crisp is literally saying, okay, our entire lives, not just a portion of our lives, but our entire lives are his. You've heard Paul say to die is gain, and you find your life in Christ. Well, once you die to yourself, once you burn yourself as an offering, you find true life in Christ. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool how the Old Testament pulls together the New Testament. Then the next thing we say, okay, that fellowship offering. The best part is we're not alone. God says, hey, you've got other believers. You've got an entire group of people, my elect people, who are willing to follow me. So when you have a struggle, when you say, okay, God, I just, I'm having a hard day. I'm struggling with all these things. God, I know that I want to date. God, I know that I want to marry somebody, but I don't know what you want me to do. I know this girl's amazing, but I don't know if I should pursue her. God, I know that this guy's really cool and that he wants to date me, but I know at the same time that he doesn't love you and doesn't honor you. But it doesn't really matter, right? Because he's really, really attractive, and I could have a good time. And see, this is where we have our fellowship. We say, you know what? Hey, man, I'm struggling with the same thing. No, I'm not struggling with one to date a guy. Let's just clear that up. But, <laughs> that was weird. But we all have these struggles. And so that fellowship offering is us saying, God, we admit that we have issues. We admit that we're struggling. But more than that, we're just grateful that we get to spend time in your presence. We voluntarily give ourselves up so that we can spend time in your presence. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty cool. Now, I'm actually going to make a little parallel really quick, so I need to flip my Bible to Hebrews 10. Actually, I think it's on, on the wall. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. Let's see if we have that. All right, so we talked about this idea of a sacrifice. Now, this is in the, the New Testament, towards the end of the New Testament. And it says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So let's, let's, wait, go back. Let's dissect that for a second. So it says the law is a shadow of good things. We all have seen shadows, right? I mean, if you look at me right now, I've got a shadow behind me. In fact, one day, I saw a shadow behind me, and it looked huge. So I thought there was this big guy walking behind me at the gym, so I got out of his way so he could walk by. And then I realized, oh, it's just my shadow. And the light was just making me look really big because it was awkward. So sometimes shadows distort things, but shadows are always based off of something that's real, right? So when we talk about this idea of a shadow of good things, there's only one good thing this world has ever seen, and that's Christ, right? Because nothing is good unless it's perfect, and nothing is perfect unless it's of God. And God is perfect, and Christ was God in flesh. So then the next part of it, we say, okay, well, oh, hang on, I lost it. So it says, like, by the same sacrifices that were continually offered every year, Make perfect those who draw near. If something can make you perfect, you'd be perfect forever, right? Because once you're made new, you're new. Like we're told that when we become Christ followers, we have a heart of stone that's replaced with the heart of flesh. The old is gone, the new has come. We're a new creation in Christ, right? So this idea that, okay, why would I need to sacrifice again and again and again and again and again 
to forgive my sins. My sins should be forgiven once and for all. Just done. I'm redeemed. So let's go to the next verse. So otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of their sins. I couldn't read for a second there. Next verse. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, and four is where it comes. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, I find it odd that it says it's impossible for the blood to be taken away, or for the sin to be taken away by blood, when God clearly says for seven chapters how to tear animals apart, Uncle Si and Uncle Phil style, sprinkle their blood all over the altars. And then burn the animals. And God says that, right? He says, if you want to get right with me, you've got to shed blood. You've got to shed blood. But this verse basically says that these things cannot take away our sins. Now, what's curious is the Old Testament never says that blood sacrifices of that nature take away our sins. It never says that it removes our sins. It says it's a pleasant aroma to God. Eleven times, I don't have eleven fingers, but eleven times it says that, and the smell was pleasing to God. So God was pleased in that instant. But sin is not a temporary thing, is it? No, not at all. See, sin is something that continues on and on and on. And some of you might have wondered why I brought this manure up here on stage, which I'm really disappointed. It doesn't even smell as bad as I was hoping. Like I thought it was going to be rank, and it's not. And as I was talking, as I described the burnt offering, I started throwing roses on it, you know, just kind of trying to mask the smell because roses smell like plants to me. (laughs) Just saying. I tried to spray a little bit of this apple crisp spray on here. Woohoo! And that would make it smell better. It made it smell worse, actually. So (laughs) I tried to cover it up. And then I said, you know what? We have our sin offering. We killed a bull took it outside the city. We covered our sins and removed them as far as the east is from the west. No, we didn't. We put them outside. I can still see it out there. It's right there. (laughs) Like, and it's the same idea with this manure. This manure could represent your sin. You can spray it. You can cover it. I don't care what you do with it. But until you address the fact that it's poop, it's manure, and it, st- it smells terrible. And so you get rid of it, it's going to be there. And it's the same with your sin. It's the same with my sin. That struggle with pornography lasted probably like eight years. It's the weirdest thing. And all of a sudden, I got to the point where I didn't even think I was struggling. It was just kind of like, okay, cool, whatever. I'm still not having sex. I've never dated, whatever. It's not a big deal. And to me, was it a big deal? No, not at all. I looked like a great guy. I didn't date girls. I cared more about fishing in school than anything else. Like, literally, that's all I cared about. But it was when I was in college, and by that time I had said, okay, maybe this is not for me, and I had gotten help with it, that I realized that that addiction to pornography had changed my entire life. Because sin transforms us, right? Sin changes us from the inside out. Now, we think, okay, God has made us new. God has made us a new creation. We've got that, that God nature inside of us. But we're still susceptible to sin. And so what sin did was all of a sudden it desensitized me. I saw things in a totally different way. I saw girls in a totally different way. I already said I didn't care about dating, right? But I had a ton of amazing Christian female friends, and I ruined those relationships because I didn't know how to treat them. I didn't know how to act around them. I was arrogant. I was obnoxious. I was all these things that I shouldn't have been, and at times I still am today. I'm still learning how to say, okay, God, how do you view your daughters? How do you view your sons? How do you view the creation that you not only handmade, but that you breathed life into? Because if you look in Genesis, we are the only creation that God not only handmade, but actually breathed life into. You are special. No matter what anybody says, no matter what you think, God has made you special. How do you view those people? I had to spend time in God's Word to understand what he thought about his, his daughters and what he thought about his sons. And I'm still trying to figure out what he thinks about his daughters and his sons because I still struggle every day with sometimes just caring. I might say, you know what, it doesn't matter to me. And God says, well, Q, it should. You want to be a minister, right? 
You want to love on people. You want to guide my flock. You want to feed my sheep. You need to care about them. I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's probably a good idea. My bad. Like, it's, it's not all about just saying I understand the Bible or I understand this or I understand that. It's about saying, God, what is your desire? What is your purpose for my life? And that's the transformation that goes across as we realize, okay, yes, our sin can be removed, but God does so much more in us than that. So is this, is this making sense? Are you guys tracking with me? Yes? Heads on? All right, cool. So thanks for the clap. That was strange. Okay, so anyway. No, stop it. Stop it. I'm not even done. Here. Really? Stop. Stop. I'm not done. Seriously. <laughs> Can you please stop? All right. That was the most embarrassing moment of my life right there. You guys are, you're obnoxious. Stop it. <laughs> I seriously have to finish this message. You have to stop. <laughs> All right. So the reason I brought this one, shh, shh, seriously. Hey, this is the serious part. You need to stop. Y'all are uncontrollable. The reason, <laughs> but I love you guys. All right. The reason that I brought this manure up here was I wanted to help you realize something. No matter how much I dressed up my sin and I went to church all the time, led with young life, read the Bible, understanding scripture, debating scripture, no matter how much I was in church or doing good things, quote unquote good things, I could not hide the fact that I had something rotten in my life. I still have things that are rotten in my life. We all have things that are rotten in our lives, right? because we have sin in our lives. See, Jesus doesn't say, hey, you can sacrifice me one time on the cross, and then once you've done it, you gotta do it again once you think about a sin again, or once you sin and do it again, do it again, do it again. Once and done, that's your savior. Once and done. Just like the bull was taken outside, the sin offering, pay attention to this, just like the sin offering was taken out of the city, outside of the presence of God's people, and it was cast away, and it was not brought back in. Just like that, Christ takes your sin and removes it from you. Now, here's something interesting that I didn't tell you about that sin offering. That meat that they burned outside, outside of the city, the priest could eat that. The priest who burned it could eat that meat, but no other person could, right? We talk, I, thought I did talk about that. Now, here's something curious that's in 1 Peter 2, 9. And it says that we are royal priesthood. So as priests, we can take part in the feast. We can take part in who Jesus is. Because no longer is Jesus exclusive to those who know a lot about God, who come from a royal bloodline. Jesus is offered to all his people. Jesus goes to every single person and says, will you have me? How cool is that? How incredible is the idea that the one who redeemed and saved us from our sins simply asked, will you have me? No longer are we shedding the blood of animals. No longer do we have to give up all these things. He says, will you have me? And if so, will you lay down your life as an offering, a pleasing and fragrant offering to my Father? And in doing so, you find true life. By giving up what is dead, by removing what is dead and what smells and what smells like rotten decay to God, you are given life. Now, I feel like that's a pretty good trade. I feel like that's an amazing trade. Now, to those of you who are Christ followers, you might think, okay, well, yeah, I know that Jesus forgives me of my sins. I know that he's redeemed me from my sins. But sometimes we have a hard time living in that. Sometimes we have a hard time realizing that, you know what, God? You've given me liberation from every single sin that I will ever do. And you've given me a heart that's created to honor and glorify you. It's kind of hard sometimes, right? I mean, I'm in ministry right now. And sometimes I struggle with, here's an unintentional sin. You guys might struggle with also. Here's an unintentional sin. There are many times where I wake up and I'm just kind of like, hey, I'll, I'll read my Bible later on. It's, it's cool. Or the day has gone through. I'm like, all right, I made a commitment to read my Bible every day. Let's spend time with God. I read two verses. Okay, I'm done. Cool. Is that devotion to God? I like how y'all are shaking your head and making me feel guilty. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
But you're right. Don't, don't. No, stop, stop. Oh. <laughs> stop. Stop clapping. Seriously, stop clapping. Stop clapping. Stop. Stop clapping. Devotion to God. That first offering that's mentioned in, in Leviticus 1, devotion requires you being absolutely, totally sold out. That's what a Christ follower is. That's what a Christ follower does. We say, no matter what happens, God, I'm going to serve you. No matter where you take me, God, I'm going to follow you. No matter what happens in my life, God, I know that you are my perfect peace and perfect counselor, and you've redeemed me. Now, for those of you who don't have Christ in your life, we've all got this. And God's going to address this in our lives at the day of judgment. He's either going to say, you chose to follow my son. You stumbled a lot, but you followed me. Or he's going to say, you didn't choose to follow my son. There are those who are going to go and spend eternity with God because they acknowledge the fact that they had sin in their lives. They acknowledge the fact that they need redemption. They acknowledge the fact that they need God, that they can't do it all on their own. And then they celebrate it in the fact that God says, I can take care of that. I've got an app for that. It's called God app. What's up? And then there are going to be those people who say, God, I didn't, I didn't know. Nobody told me. I didn't listen. I'm so sorry. I wish I had. Listen, if you don't know who God is, if you don't know who Jesus is in your life and in your heart, you need to think about tonight's message. Not just because I'm saying it. It's, what I say doesn't matter at all. It's because God says it. God created you perfectly. He created you to be in fellowship with him. But something in our lives, something inside of us, has distracted us from that, has pulled us away from that. And once you miss the mark, you've missed it forever. You get a 99.99998 on a test, I don't care what you do. There's no rounding in God's scale. Either you're perfect or you're not. God sacrificed the perfect offering on the cross, on a cursed death. And then he said, you can take part in this feast. You can be in the royal priesthood and have eternal life. But you have to give your life up for me. You have to realize that what you are living, what you are doing, is this. It's dressed up. It's made to look pretty. It's made to look fragrant and beautiful. It's got rose petals on it. Your life might look beautiful and amazing on the outside, but you are dead on the inside. We all need Christ in our lives. So if you guys would just pray with me really quick, it'd be amazing. I'd love it so much. Dear Lord, thank you for the fact that you've given us laws to obey, that you've given us rules to guide our hearts and guide our spirits. But even more importantly, Lord, that you have given us something greater than the law, something that will fulfill the law in a new way. You've given us your son, Jesus Christ. God, I'm so grateful as a Christ follower for the fact that every time I mess up, which is every day, that you say, all right, well, let's keep walking. Let's keep walking. You don't put me down. You don't say you're terrible. You say, I'm still working on you. I'm grateful for that, God. And I'm so glad that we have these students and these leaders who have a desire to follow you, Lord, who have a desire to be guided by you, by your heart and by your will. And I know that we struggle each day, Lord, but I pray that in those struggles, we'd realize that, Lord, you give us strength, Lord, that you call us out of those struggles to be your creation. And God, for those in here who don't know who you are, who don't have the spirit of your son, the spirit of your spirit inside of them, God, I pray that they would really think about, okay, what am I doing with my life? Does my life look good on the outside and is it terrible on the inside? Am I gonna spend eternity in a place that's in peace or am I gonna spend eternity separated from you, living in my sin and dying in my sin? I pray that you don't die in your sin because to die in your sin is to be separated from God for all eternity. So if you've made the decision that, you know what, I want to learn what it means to trust you, God. I want to learn what it means to just lean on your will and on your heart. Just pray this prayer with me really quick. And it doesn't have to be verbatim what I say, but just pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I acknowledge the fact that you are God, that you are a holy, set-apart being, and that I am I'm a sinner, that I have an evil nature inside of me that is completely disgusting to you. 
And I'm so grateful for the fact that you have sent your son to die for me, Lord, and to rise again, to say that death cannot stand against you, Lord. So God, I pray that you would take my sins on the cross, Lord, and that you would make me new and make me yours. And God, I don't know what that's going to look like every day of my life, but I know that I can just follow you and that I can be yours. So God, I pray that you would give me the strength to stand for you, Lord. I pray that you would give me the strength to be bold and be devoted to who you are, fully knowing that acknowledging your son as the Lord of my life is what's going to save my life. It's what's going to take me and make me new. So God, I'm grateful for who you are, and I pray these things in your son's name. Now, I don't want you to open your eyes or to look up, but if you prayed that prayer, shoot your hand up, because we've got people in here who are more than happy and more than willing to pray with you and to talk to you about the greatest decision of your life. And please respect those around you. Keep your eyes closed and your heads down because I'm looking at you. So anybody else? Anybody else pray to receive Christ tonight? I'm so grateful that you did because in all honesty, I want to see you in eternity. I want to be able to hang out and say, hey, isn't our God amazing?